Today's New Testament lesson is Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Thanks be to God. We continue in Exodus for the Old Testament reading today. You'll remember last week we heard about the baby Moses, 
Moses grew up in the palace. Presumably he got a great education, but he knew all the time that he was a Hebrew. One day when he had grown up, he killed a guard who was beating a Hebrew slave. And so he flees to Midian, where he marries and goes to work for his father-in-law. And this is where Moses has been for many years when we pick up today's text. This is Exodus 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I imagine that every pastor has a call story of sorts an account of hearing God say, I want you to do this thing to become a pastor in the case of pastors. Mine began when I walked into associate pastor Wendy Thode's office. I went there to share the joyful news with her that I was pregnant with our second child. And she responded by saying, that's great. And we've been talking here and we think you ought to go to seminary. It was not exactly how I envisioned that conversation going. When I asked her why, she said, among other things, that she noted a kind of theological curiosity in me. It is true that I went to ask her a lot of questions. I do not think she was just trying to get rid of me. One never knows. For me, her response was, unexpected, but ultimately welcomed. It was a nagging answer to the sense that I had had that God was asking me for more of my time. And as a mother of a young child and a full-time volunteer in the church and community, 
I did not have more time to give, but she helped me understand that I could give my life in a different way. Curiosity is also at the beginning of Moses' story. His willingness to turn aside and see is the start of it all. Even wandering through the wasteland of Midian, Moses is available and open to something new that God would say to him to show him. God only calls out upon seeing Moses' curiosity and wondering, only speaks after noting that Moses is paying attention. But where many receive God's invitation joyfully, Moses was a little less than excited. The argument he puts up here is only the beginning of the conversation he and God will have about whether he's really called to this work or not. Ultimately, they work it out, but Moses doesn't give his life over quickly. He even goes so far as to say, oh Lord, please send someone else. And I had my moments of that also. Moses doesn't go without conditions either. His brother Aaron to accompany and speak for him being the primary one. I too tried to lay conditions on God, God ignored them, but as usual, that was for the best for me. So biblical call stories tell us that when God speaks to us, there are consequences for our lives. I can't think of one example in which God spoke to someone simply so they could hear or just believe something. God's speech is a call to action. Moses' call is not to the pastorate, and it is not only pastors who receive calls. Old Testament theologian Terence Fretheim remarks that Moses' call is a socio-political one. Moses is not called to offer comfort to the people or work with them to make their lives better even while they remain enslaved. He's called to assist God in resisting slavery and calling for freedom. He is their advocate, and he acts in cooperation with God. As much as this text is about Moses hearing God's call, it's also about the God who does the calling. The God who calls Moses is the same God we discussed last week, who shapes a people to resist power that oppresses, enslaves, and destroys. This God is the one who sees the misery of those being oppressed, who hears the cry of his people, who knows their suffering. The Hebrew indicates not just head knowledge, says Fredheim again, as if God gained some new information or new insight into the situation, the kind of knowing that God does is the kind that shares an experience with another, so much so that the other's experience can be called one's own. Knowing that God comes to deliver. I hope you hear the parallels between the God we meet here and the one we meet in Jesus. With his disciples, or Peter at least, finally able to say, yes, Lord, you are the Messiah, Jesus has to begin to teach them what that looks like. So from that point on, he begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Like Moses, Peter too will balk at this calling, for as a follower of Christ, it is his own calling, especially as one who has just been told he's the rock on which Jesus will build the church, who's just been given the keys to the kingdom. Not only does Peter seek to turn away from that path of suffering, but he encourages Jesus to do the same. Jesus has been down this road before. 
The time that he spent in the wilderness is in the background here. The time when, faced with temptation of imperial power, when he was promised that all the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor would be his if only he would follow Satan's way and not God's. Jesus was able to say an emphatic no at that time, and he does so again here. Neither Moses nor Peter was terribly keen on finding their calling in suffering, either their own or by joining the suffering of others. But I am not going to sit in judgment on them. I know people who have found their calling in suffering, often their own, and it is hard. That is an understatement. Whether those people sought to turn away in the beginning or not, I do not know, but I do know that ultimately each found deep fulfillment in answering God's call. For some of them, it was their life's work. For others, it was one part of their discipleship, part of their presence in the church. There was a couple in Middle Spring who had a still-term, still-born, full-term baby. Their baby, Elizabeth, died in utero mere days before her due date. And each year, on the date of her birth and death, her parents would place a single yellow rosebud up in the chancel area, and they asked me to share with everyone why it was there. They hoped to destigmatize what had happened to them and to also let other grieving parents know that they were available for counsel and consolation, no matter what it cost them. Drew's Hope in Chippensburg offers grief counseling programs for children. The center and its programming came into existence after Marcy and Randy Taylor suffered the death of their three-year-old son in a tragic car accident. While they, as adults, were able to find support and counseling, they could not find any grief support for their six-year-old daughter, Drew's sister. So they began their own ministry, and they now have a dedicated space, and their work has grown to include programming and multiple support groups for people of all ages. Others I know have survived cancer only to willingly walk with others who are undergoing treatment. Some have made a difficult but lasting commitment to sobriety and now walk with those battling addiction. Not all of us have that kind of suffering in our lives. But that's when we learn, when we lean into emulating the God we worship, the God who knows the suffering of others. And perhaps the closest we can come to that kind of knowing is empathy. Empathy means feeling with others and seeking as best we are able to take on their perspective without judging and without silver lining it, telling them, trying to make them feel better by telling them to look on the bright side. Researcher Brene Brown points out that empathy fuels connection whereas sympathy drives disconnection. And there's a fabulous three-minute video online. You can Google Brene Brown empathy video. Ultimately, Moses' willingness to turn aside and see leads him to empathic leadership among God's children. Peter's willingness to endure suffering for the sake of others does the same as he leads the fledgling church. As a church, I hope we'll continue to turn aside, willing to see with empathy the suffering we find right in our midst, here in our community, and that our empathy will further our service and our commitment to advocacy. There's a warning too that comes with these two stories. Moses initially lets his fear get in the way of his response. 
So what fears do we harbor that hold us back? How do we let our dreams of grandiosity get in the way of our calling, as Peter did initially? Saying no to the way of Jesus happens far too often in the church. Too often when Jesus says, cross, the church says, crown, or in some contexts, perhaps, flag. So what might we, in this community, toss up as our reason that we cannot bear the cross? Beloveds, the mission of God in Christ gives shape and substance to the life and work of the church. As our Savior Jesus Christ did, we will find our rising in our dying. Let us look to the God who loves us enough to know the suffering of the world, to know our suffering. Let us learn and live. Amen. You are God's called and sent people. Go out into the world in peace, relying on the strength of our Savior to see us through joining into God's mission in the world. And as you go, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>